Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Yan Yu, founder of the Calgary Guide to Understanding Disease. For those new to the channel, welcome to the Calgary Guide video series. And for those joining us again, welcome back. Today we're going to do a content video. Now I debated in what order I should present our Calgary Guide content to you, because we have over 800 different topics. Ultimately, I decided that for the first few content videos, I'm going to show you the most popular and the most well-studied flowcharts in our collection. If you have any suggestions of what slide you want to see next, or in what order I should present in, please leave a comment down below. I'll be glad to hear from you. For today, I thought we could present a highly topical flowchart, COVID-19, Pathophysiology, and Clinical Findings. As a reminder, you can help support us in our work by liking the video right as it's starting out, and also subscribing to my channel. Before we begin, I'd just like to clarify that a Calgary Guide slide is not meant to be a slideshow slide. It's actually meant to be a textbook replacement. So even though this looks busy, please keep in mind that we're comparing this slide with a textbook chapter. And as you can see, we've managed to summarize a highly complex topic into one page. So let's start at the top left where we typically start Calgary Guide slides. COVID-19 is a disease caused by the severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2. It's a beta coronavirus, a positive sense, single-stranded RNA virus. We should also clarify that the level at which we present information in Calgary Guide flowcharts is at a first-year university biology level. So that's the level of terminology with which we'll communicate in these videos. So starting at the top left, we see that respiratory droplets, whether they're produced by coughing, sneezing, talking, or even breathing by either humans or animal vectors infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus is what starts off the infection chain. Now, the mechanism of infection is debated, but we have sufficient evidence, and this slide was updated on August 18th, 2021, we have enough evidence to say that the virus adheres to small droplets, droplets that are less than five micrometers in diameter, which are aerosolized and become airborne during the cough, sneezing, talking, or breathing process. And these airborne aerosols are then inhaled, and that's how patients come to be exposed to the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Other potential mechanisms include the droplets contacting the mucous membranes of the eyes, nose, and mouth of the recipient, or live viral particles adhering to inanimate objects called fomites, such as doorknobs. And when the recipient touches the infected fomite, and then subsequently touches any of their mucous membranes, that recipient can also become infected. So once the patient is exposed to the virus, the virus spreads in the body via number one, mucous membrane spread to surrounding cells, and number two, through the bloodstream. What the virus does is it uses the spike protein to adhere to the angiotensin converting enzyme two, or the ACE2 receptor on body cells. The viral spike protein mimics ACE2, and in a complex mechanism that's outside the scope of this slide, gains access into the cell. Once inside the cell, the virus disassembles, releasing the viral RNA, which takes over the host cell's ribosomes in the cytoplasm to make new viral proteins, such as RNA polymerases, that are responsible for producing new viral RNA. The viral RNA and viral proteins are then packaged into new viral particles, the new virus is assembled within the cell and released from the cell and in doing so kills the cell and contributes to disease symptoms. At this point, the viruses that are newly made can further spread in the body via mucous membrane spread and by the bloodstream. The average incubation period, which means time from initial infection to symptom onset, is four to five days and can be up to 14 days. Once the patient is infected with COVID-19, they can become symptomatic. And the reasons for the symptoms are as follows. The virus can proliferate in the cells of tissues with ACE2 receptors, most often in the lungs via type 2 pneumocytes, in the vasculature via endothelial cells, in the kidneys, such as the cells of the proximal tubular epithelium, in the heart, such as myocardial cells, and in the GI tract, specifically infecting enterocytes. Multiple mechanisms can then branch off this common pathophysiology. First, in the lungs, when neutrophils move to the lungs to respond to the attacker, they release reactive oxygen species and cytokines. These reactive oxygen species and cytokines irritate the airways and trigger cough. They also cause alveolar and capillary damage, which results in inflammatory fluid accumulating in the interstitium and the alveoli. That's what causes the bilateral ground glass opacities 
seen on CT of the lungs, and the interstitial infiltrates seen on a chest x-ray. Because of the fluid accumulation in the interstitial tissues, the distance for oxygen to diffuse from the alveoli to the capillaries is increased, which reduces the oxygen saturation in the blood. That causes a sensation of dyspnea. In response to the reduced blood O2 saturation, the heart tries to compensate for the hypoxemia by increasing cardiac output, which strains the myocardium. This puts the heart in a state that's prone to arrhythmias, called an arrhythmogenic state. Now, a complementary pathway parallels the first series of mechanisms. The virus causes cell death and increases in inflammation, which triggers the immune response to enter the sites of infection. The immune response will produce cytokines that cause direct myocardial cell damage, which increases the serum troponin level as a marker for myocardial damage, and also further puts the heart at a risk of arrhythmia. Moreover, the cytokines induce the hypothalamus to release prostaglandins, which increase body temperature to fight the infection, which results in fever. Finally, the inflammatory cytokines and the immune response that they trigger cause direct skeletal muscle cell damage, which causes myalgia or muscle pain. That was a summary of why COVID-19 presents with the symptoms that it does. Now, of course, the symptoms for COVID-19 are on a continuum. Mild COVID-19 symptoms consist of fever, cough, myalgia and fatigue, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and loss of taste or smell. Moderate to severe COVID symptoms consist of worsening dyspnea, increased respiratory rate, reduced O2 saturation. Chest x-ray will often show bilateral infiltrates, which become pro progressively worse. And finally, critical COVID-19 patients exhibit respiratory failure, septic shock, and multiple organ dysfunction. That's all for today. Thanks so much for your attention. Again, if you have any thoughts about the order I should present the Calgary Guide content in, please leave a comment down below. I'd love to hear from you. Also, if you notice any scientific or medical issues with the content, please let me know as well. You can email us at calgaryguide at gmail.com. Once again, please support us in our work by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. And thank you very much again for your time and attention. I'll see you in the next video.